Running a steam train has always been hard work. Running a steam train in the 21st century, some would argue, is even harder. Given the complexities of keeping these old locomotives and rolling stock in shape, the rail preservation industry knows of no bounds when it comes to adapting to its natural surroundings. While the industry has faced challenge after challenge for decades, nowhere has this been made more apparent than in the 2010s. It's too easy to look at the decade in general and think everything was bad or this was the best time of our lives. Is it that easy to generalize though? Memory has a way of blotching out the good or bad moments, big or small, and can create a misguided sense of nostalgia or regret. Everyone looks at the rail preservation scene differently, so it's hard to come to a definitive conclusion about how we feel about the outcome of certain things. The most effective way to tell is to go back and look at the big picture with all of its tiny details. And that's where we're going to showcase for you all today. This is what the rail preservation industry got up to in the 2010s. For most casual observers, the steam locomotive is the first thing that comes to mind when railroads in history are mentioned in the same sentence. Any seasoned rail enthusiast or volunteer will tell you that the difference between an active locomotive versus a static one is clear as day, yet it's hard to put in the words for some reason. Restoring these engines from the ground up takes a ton of effort, no matter what the size, the condition, or how well equipped the engine is. Various calls to action were heard throughout the decade. Fire up 611! Fire up 1309! Fire up 2100! Bring back 757! Names like the New England Steam Corporation, the Kentucky Steam Heritage Corporation, the Nashville Steam Preservation Society, the Cumbres and Toltec Special Projects Department, the Wanami 9 Project, and even U.S. Sugar all rose to the challenge of pulling notable steam locomotives out of slumber and putting them into the spotlight like never before. Many of these engines are currently under the knife as they get components and their leases on life renewed. Some returns to steam are welcome surprises under varying circumstances. Southern Railway 4501 and Norfolk and Western 611 got their chances because of the promise of mainline running behind the new 21st Century Steam program. Others, like Moore Keppel & Company Climax 9 and the Columbia River Belt Company's Skookum, were left for dead at the end of the steam era, with doubts cast that their carcasses would ever feel life again. Yet by the determination and willpower of volunteers, contractors, and donors, these engines have arisen from the ashes and have found new homes within the modern world being adored by a new generation of admirers. Also emerging from the back shops in 2019 was the last locomotive anyone had expected, a Union Pacific Big Boy. Why was this unprecedented? It was widely assumed that running one of the largest engines in the world would be more trouble than it was worth, owing largely to the size of the railroad's infrastructure limiting where the engine could go. But UP set out to do the impossible with Big Boy number 4014, to commemorate a very important milestone in its history. But the power of Steam's revival isn't just limited to restoring the old. In July 2013, a brand new 440 American type, known simply as York, was pressed into service for an all new startup. Steam into History, located in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, sets itself apart from other numerous tourist pikes by the era it recreates, the 1860s. In that decade, this route was of strategic importance during the Civil War and was traveled on by President Abraham Lincoln more than once. When paired up with recreated wooden passenger cars built by the Reader Railroad, Steam into History truly was recreating an era left untapped by other tourist lines. Although not as numerous as overseas efforts, some notable new build projects are well underway, like the Virginia and Truckee 260 Lion being made first by San Gentry of Clear Lake, Iowa, before moving to the Nevada State Railroad Museum for finishing, and the most ambitious one of all, the Pennsylvania T1 Locomotive Trust, which aims to build an all-new 4444 T1 duplex locomotive from the ground up. But there's a reason why railroads moved away from steam power back in the 20th century. As modern as some steam engines are designed, they are still labor-intensive, dirty, and take cubic feet worth of dollars to keep operating. 
While steam can draw the crowds, diesels have their fans too. This was most apparent in May 2014 at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Streamliners at Spencer commemorated 75 years since the birth of EMD's FT, which many rail fans point to as the turning point of dieselization. Accompanying the FT were 27 different locomotives, all hailing from four corners of the country with equally diverse backgrounds. Over the three-day weekend, Streamliners at Spencer generated $1.6 million in economic impact from the estimated 9,000 visitors who came from 41 states and five countries to see this once-in-a-lifetime gathering. Some of these vintage units would reappear in places deniers would least expect. For November 2017, CSX brought an old friend back to home rails, with Clinchfield F3AU 800 leading the cherished Santa train on its 75th running from Pikeville, Kentucky to Kingsport, Tennessee. With the locomotive just acquired by Vintage Locomotives, Inc., the F unit was shipped to CSX's shops in Huntington, West Virginia, where the gray and yellow colors of its Clinchfield heritage were revived. Along with Clinchfield painted SD45 3632, actually former Atlantic Coastline 2024, they retraced their familiar turf with an unprecedented cavalcade of rail fans following them all the way. Like their steam-breathing predecessors, work is in progress for diesels of all shapes, sizes, and eras, ranging from the CB&Q Mark Twain Zephyr by the Wisconsin Great Northern and the Santa Fe PA at the Museum of American Railroading in Texas. One remarkable completion in 2019 was Southern Pacific 9010 one of the few diesel-hydraulic-powered locomotives to operate in the United States. Starting out with a rusted-out sectioned carcass, volunteers fabricated a new nose, restored fixtures, acquired an original Maybach prime mover, and set up the unit's electrics to allow it to operate as a cab car, with diesels like Torpedo Boat 5623 providing power. Plans call for the last remaining kinks in the Maybach to be worked out, so the 9010 can operate wholly on its own at the Niles Canyon Railway in Sonol, California. In 2005, Union Pacific started the trend of painting its modern diesels into special paint schemes of past railroads it had acquired over the years, commonly referring to them as heritage units. The trend would be kept up by Amtrak in 2011 for its 40th birthday, with locomotives and some passenger cars adorning past paint schemes and the well-equipped exhibit train showcasing its evolution. The next year, for its 30th birthday, Norfolk Southern would take the concept above and beyond with 20 heritage units, all painted for individual fallen flags and posed together for a special gathering at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. This gathering would set the stage for the Streamliners event two years later. The trend continues to this day, with Canadian National fielding a more modest fleet of five units in fallen flag schemes to commemorate 25 years of transitioning for being government-operated to privatization. In May 2018, CSX lent its biggest helping hand yet to preservation. With a ceremony staged in the old East Kentucky mining town of Ravenna, the Class 1 donated to Kentucky Steam its sprawling abandoned yard complex, complete with modern shop buildings, offices, and lots of space for redevelopment into the 2716's new home, and then some. The property will become known as the Kentucky Rail Heritage Center, where the CNO 2716 will be based among Kishko's growing fleet of locomotives and rolling stock. Then on June 11th came the ultimate story of salvation. On the outskirts of Detroit sits the old Michigan Central Station, a once bustling hub of the New York Central. Since the end of the passenger service in 1988, the building has gradually fallen into ruins, with some efforts to stave off the deterioration only amounting to so much. It would be on this date, though, when the entire property would be purchased by a very unlikely buyer, the Ford Motor Company. Yes, the company that started the automobile revolution that would in turn lure passengers away from trains as far back as the 1900s. Why this old station? Apart from its status as a cultural landmark, Ford plans to repurpose the structure as a testing and research center for producing autonomous and electric vehicles. The station is the centerpiece of a wider plan to build up a Ford campus within the city's Corktown area and breathe new life into a historically depressed part of the country. What's more, artifacts that had gone missing since the station's closure, like the clock, 
cast iron wall scones, and elevator buttons, came out of the woodwork and were returned to the station for Ford to reinstall. While Ford's vision called for restoring the station to its original splendor, it says to expect some modern refinements too. Although it takes years of planning, thousands of dollars, and a metric ton of paperwork to organize, the events draw in hundreds of thousands of spectators. For the first excursions with NNW 611 in 2015, it was estimated that Roanoke County in general took up $7 million from visitors coming to see and ride behind the J. What's better than one operating steamer, though? How about seven? Train Festival 2011, held for four days in the Quad Cities between Illinois and Iowa, was one of the biggest social get-togethers for rail fans and rail equipment, old and new. Highlights included mainline excursions over the Iowa Interstate Railroad, with the Nickel Plate Road 765 and Iowa Interstate 6988 putting in strong performances, along with an exceptionally rare appearance by the cb and Nebraska Zephyr, owned and operated by the Illinois Railway Museum. A similar train expo event would be held in Owasso, Michigan in June 2014, with the 765 reuniting with fellow Berkshire Pierre Marquette 1225 for a repeat performance of the groundbreaking Train Festival 2009. It was plain to see how steam was holding its place in the 21st century, especially in places where it was previously assumed would never run again. Between 2011 and 2015, Norfolk Southern would welcome a total of four steam locomotives to lead fan trips over its network. Although nowhere near the size and scope of the original NS Steam program, seeing Southern Railway's 630 and 4501, along with the 611 and 765 back on the main line, was truly a welcome sight. After the program, though, things would settle into a new normal. Having spent hardly a year in active service, 611 would be allowed two more years of excursions with NS, until the railroad formally ceased supporting the operations. While 611 would have to settle for modest events in North Carolina, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and 4501 and 630 with its home base at TVRM, the 765 would have its sights set on a slightly different venue. For 2017 and 18, the engine would headline the Joliet Rocket, a series of fan trips dubbed by Trains Magazine as a non-excursion excursion. Passengers boarded in Joliet and rode at speeds near 60 miles an hour with live entertainment up to LaSalle Street Station in Chicago. They would disembark to their very own VIP party, complete with a dance floor, historically flavored cocktails, and inspired appetizers. Unlike rail fan oriented adventures, these trips offered casual observers a glimpse into a different time period, with the train acting mostly as a mode of transportation to the venue. Compared to all-day-long slogs that the industry is used to operating, the Joliet Rocket was a much-needed breath of fresh air. Until then, there was nothing else like it. This may be a source of inspiration for organizations looking to expand their foothold in their community. Then came the one milestone to blow all of the other events out of the water. 2019 marked 150 years since completing the United States' first-ever transcontinental railroad. On the exact date, an estimated 40,000 visitors gathered around the replicas of the Jupiter and 119, standing on a single track, half a world behind each back. For the Union Pacific, there was no better time to roll out the big boy. In the weeks before and after the event, both the 4014 and the 844 would doublehead from their home base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, all the way to Ogden, Utah, where they staged their own face-off with UP and state officials in attendance. Not mincing words, it was a gathering for the ages. But the highlights were offset by trade-offs. In 2011, the East Broadtap of Orbansonia, Pennsylvania, finished off its 50th season of carrying visitors along the longest-lasting narrow-gauge railroad east of the Mississippi River. Only at the end of this season, the railroad would not reopen. Going forward, this was the beginning of a period of slumber for the little line that had held on since 1956, when it was purchased ironically by a scrap salvaging company. Some hits would come harder than others, however. In March 2018, Amtrak announced that they were curtailing their support for passenger excursion trains, meaning that mainline steam excursions, 
as well as long-supported traditions like the New River Train, would no longer be supported with their insurance umbrella. Also reduced from being a frequent sight were private passenger cars on the back of their trains, which Amtrak cited as a source of delays and liability concerns. The preservation industry as a whole has been trying to leverage its support to allow them back ever since. In July that year, the Indiana Transportation Museum was evicted from the grounds it had long leased from the city of Noblesville. What resulted was a mass exodus of its equipment, with the cherished Nickel Plate 587 being divided up into three sections and moved by tractor trailer to Kishko's new home in Ravenna, Kentucky. More locomotives and rolling stock would be scattered to the winds with new owners, while others would be scrapped to reduce the baggage to carry. This was carried out with mixed results, as the Monon SW1 had its cab decapitated by a highway overpass. Throughout that same summer, the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad suffered trial after trial. First, a wildfire erupted alongside the right of way, and the railroad was blamed, although the exact cause is still under investigation. Following closely behind was a washout that cut Durango off and the rest of its fleet necessitating a bus substitution to Rockwood, where passengers would meet the train and ride to Silverton. With another washout in 2020, tainted by litigation issues tracing back to the 416 fire, the railroad can't seem to catch a break. In the meantime, the railroad resolved to lower the stress even further by investing in both new diesels and secondhand ones from the White Pass and Yukon, and converting some members of its steam fleet from coal to oil firing. To that end, the railroad would briefly lease out the newly restored Southern Pacific 18 to allow operating crews to learn the ins and outs of oil firing. In the face of adversity, the Durango and Silverton is the embodiment of the old saying, if you're going through hell, keep going. Then in 2020 came the biggest existential crisis of all, COVID-19. With this airborne disease brought onto the industry, and indeed the entire world, was a complete shakedown of social interaction. Seemingly all at once, the preservation industry put all public operations on pause, with some groups having no revenue coming in throughout all of spring, then summer too. Groups that knew how to exercise their public outreach moved fast, with the Lake Superior Railroad Museum producing a daily blog series on its Facebook page, highlighting important pieces of history in their collection and explaining their relevance to the modern world. As some states began to reopen in phases, tourist railroads like TVRM, Strasbourg, and the Cumbres and Toltec mandated face masks for all passengers and social distancing within seating. The Cassianic Railroad staged a parade of its five operating steamers in front of the railroad's vast parking lot that allowed for plenty of room for social distancing. Having the ability to safely conduct these events with strict guidelines worked in the favor of some groups, allowing for some railfan activities with the 611 at NCTM, Strasbourg marking 60 years of carrying tourists, and a photo freight with Sioux Line 1003 for Trains Magazine's 80th birthday. On the other hand, as the situation changed later in the summer, places like the Osceola and St. Croix Valley and the Western Maryland Scenic opted to sit out the remainders of their seasons. With restrictions that were lifted in September having to be reinforced in November, it was hard for operators to determine a balance between keeping its patrons safe and providing itself revenue in order to keep itself open. It remains to be seen what the full extent of COVID-19's impact will be in the long term. But being stuck in the present moment isn't stopping long-term projects from moving ahead. Online, fundraisers are in progress for this Chessie Jeep 30 for the Cincinnati Scenic Railway, two diesels for the Monticello Railway Museum, an SP chair car for ORHF, and an NNW office car for a new startup firm. All it takes to make these dreams come true is a solid business plan, a dependable team of supporters, volunteer or otherwise, and the vision to give these otherwise outdated relics the place in the modern world that they deserve. Case in point would be the East Broad Tap, which announced on February 14th of 2020 that the railroad has been sold by the Kowalczyks to an all-new, non-profit foundation who aims to bring the railroad back to life and better than ever. Throughout the year, volunteers would come together to rehabilitate track, stabilize buildings, and thoroughly restore the locomotives and rolling stock. At present, 
Two of the line's 282 Mercados are under restoration, with plans to fully reopen in 2021 with diesel power. All things considered, it's too easy to look back on the downfalls and get overwhelmed. Thanks to all kinds of factors, whether it's Amtrak's policy change, raising insurance liabilities, the state of the economy, the pandemic, or changing interests within the fandom, no one seems to be sure what the future holds for preservation in the coming years. On the other hand, there was once a time when it seemed like 611 would remain forever silent, after the previous Steam program ended in 1994. When Amtrak revised its private car and excursion guidelines, it seemed like mainline engines like 261 or 4449 now had no place to go, nor was there a place for long-standing traditions like the New River Train. For the longest time, no one believed that engines like 576 nor 2716 would ever turn the wheel again, nor would CSX be supportive of such a revival. There were similar doubts being cast about the 470, Skookum, the Mark Twain Zephyr, and the Cross Mafi. Many locomotives that saw life for the first time in this millennium, whether it was Nevada Northern 81, ZM&IR 332, or Jersey Central 113, were laid to waste for several decades, with some only cosmetically restored. Few believed that rusted-out hulks like Climax 9 could ever be pieced back together again. No one seemed to be just as willing to spend big on reviving entire railroads like the East Broadtap or the Santa Fe Southern, as they were slowly being overcome by the elements. And who would have ever thought that a big boy would move under its own power again? If the 2010s have shown anything, it's that we as an industry can and will overcome barriers. It's a basic human instinct to keep pushing on boundaries and pushing ourselves with our talents and skill sets. Nothing gives us greater satisfaction than taking something we're often told can't be done and then doing it. With all of that said, this decade was, in many ways, much better than we could have possibly imagined. Whatever the future holds for 2021 and beyond, one thing is certain. As long as there are people who are driven by passion to help these old trains, the rail preservation industry knows of no bounds.